how did you get into voice acting? Um, well, I have always been an actor and, um, and I graduated from theater school in Vancouver. Um, and when I graduated, you know, your agent just sends you out for auditions for film and TV and theater. And in, in my case, my agency also had a voice department. So they started sending me out for voice auditions. And, um, and so I've been doing it um, from the very beginning, really, as soon as I graduated from, from drama school. And the first voice jobs I did were um, dubbing Japanese cartoons into English. Yeah. Uh, so Ronin Warrior, Dragon Ball Z, that sort of thing. I wanted to talk about uh, Returnal. Yes. Um, which obviously you won a, a BAFTA for. Uh, congratulations on that. Thank um, you so much. So the the game and the plot of the story is quite, it's like shrouded in mystery. Uh, mm. And I guess like as a, as a player, you're like figuring it out as you go along. Were you aware of the wider plot when you recorded the lines? I had a kind of bird's eye view of what Celine's experience was going to be in this game. Um, right. When you record a game, at least in my experience, uh, they don't always let you in on the whole picture right, mm. right off the bat. A, because, I mean, for a character like Celine, because she is the only character in the game, it would have been masses and masses of um sort of script to read through in in, in one sitting yeah. and also i think uh, well, it depends on the game really but sometimes they don't necessarily know how things are going to to pan out and there's different branches to a game and, and all that sort of thing so sometimes you don't get the whole uh you, you know point by point plot sequence before you start so i had a sense of you know what Celine was going through this sense of crash landing on atropos yeah. the place that she isn't even she's not even meant to be there but she decides to go to follow this idea of the white shadow and i knew that that she is somebody who would you know crash land and the, and then go through this experience and then die and then she'd wake up in the same place again with a kind of burgeoning re recollection of oh my gosh i've been here before and i've done this before mm -hmm. um so and then it, the finer points of it are explained to you you know each day in the session they'll say okay this is what's happening in this particular moment and and she has just had this experience and now she's about to do this um so using that information that then you you find the kind of reality and the given circumstances of, of whatever uh the scenario is that you're that you're playing so that's kind of how that worked out for for eternal yeah do you think not being completely aware of the the wider plot um because like you said you knew you knew like bits and pieces and what the what celine's circumstance at the time was um yes. but do you think not being aware of the wider plot was helpful in a way because you were almost hmm. in the dark like her? Absolutely. I think that really is helpful. I mean, it's an interesting thing, you know, because if you're an actor in a film or a TV series, you, it would be really frowned upon if you hadn't read the script and if you didn't yeah. know the whole story and, and really have a good understanding as to the beginning, the middle and an end, so that you could really, you know, craft your, your character's arc through the story, but I, but you're absolutely right. I mean, that can also work in your favor, not knowing. Mm. And there's some directors, I think, you know, obviously in film and maybe not so much TV, but film who, who keep their actors in the dark so that they can capture that moment of discovery. And yeah. certainly in, in games, you know, we, you will have that. Um, and uh, Celine doesn't know what's going to happen mm. next. So I think that, that there is something useful in that parallel between actor not knowing and, and character not knowing. So absolutely. Yeah. Um, I also wanted to talk about, just cause I'm, I'm kind of intrigued by this. What's it like um, recording like injury or death sounds uh, for your character? Yeah. It's hard, you know, that's, that's the hard graft of acting in, in video games. Um, mm. I think when it comes down to those moments, where you are either killing or being killed, um, they can be really difficult. 
A, because physically it's quite demanding. It's, as you can imagine, it's very demanding on your voice to have a death rattle yeah. or a scream or, you know, um, and it's kind of emotionally draining too. Although it's funny, I think some, some actors find it emotionally draining, others find it inc incredibly energizing and cathartic. Like it can be oh, like yeah. a, you know, a cathartic scream, like, ah, you know, you yeah. get all your frustrations out. Um, so it can sort of work both ways, but um, it's, it's, it's slightly unnatural too in the sense that you might be doing it over and over and over again mm. um, and again you know comparing acting in games to comparing acting in film and tv um, you know film and tv there's a kind of build up to it there's this, this stuff happening around you you've probably got somebody who's killing you that you can constantly react to or maybe there's somebody yeah. that you're doing damage to and it, it kind of makes those moments easier but in a game you're really doing it by yourself so you have to manifest that moment over and over and uh, over again and and that can be quite tiring um and they tend to save those moments right at the end of a session so say you're in for four hours mm -hmm. they'll do all the screaming and everything right at the end because chances are you yeah. might lose your voice or it will certainly yeah. have impact on your voice so they can just let you let it rip and then you can go home and recover um but yeah yeah you have to use your imagination a lot because if you're being killed by being strangled then that's a certain noise if you are being harmed because you've been shot in the chest that will create a a, a different noise or yeah. maybe you've been you know somebody's thrown something at your leg so it depends you know where which part of your body is being affected, how you're dying. So you have to really invest your imagination in, in these things, um, yeah. which is creative as well. You know, it is it is definitely creative and interesting. Yeah, no, that's fair enough. Uh, you mentioned um, how it's, it's different to film and TV acting because you will have other elements to play off. Mm. Like you'll have a, a co-star. Um, yes. With, with voice acting, I have seen some videos of uh, people they'll have like a screen with their character scene in and they'll be voicing it. Uh, do you ever do something like that where you have a visual element to kind of yeah, play off? I do yeah. for sure. So sometimes like for example in Returnal they uh, would present me with a, a kind of scene that has been kind of roughly done so I understand the circumstances and I kind of get a sense of like, maybe she's fighting a, a boss or a, like a creature or something like that. So I get a sense of what it is I'm, I'm, I'm fighting against. Um, as you might know, Ross, in games, uh, there's a kind of, um, uh, what, how, how can I put it? Like a destructuring of character that goes on in the sense that the mm. body might be played by one actress um, yeah. And then the voice is done by another. So that was the, definitely the case with Returnal. The, the hands and the face was done by an actress named Anne Bayer, who lives in Los Angeles. And the body was also done in, in Los Angeles by another actress. And then I did the voice. Oh, wow. So um, they had all, all of that data um, uh, of the, the motion capture. And then I would uh, sort of voice that, you know, so I would be able to see what Anne had done and, and the other actress in terms of their movement and everything. So, for example, if somebody's running and then stopping, you have to match what the breath might be like in those instances and, yeah. and the action of stopping. And, and because we hear movement in our voices and if the player doesn't hear that, if it doesn't match up to the physicality, then um, there's going to be a, a, a disconnection there. And other games I've done, there's, um, you know, they have the, the cut scenes have already been filmed in Los Angeles with all the characters. And then it really then becomes a question almost of, of sort of dubbing really their, mm. their mouth movements and making your performance fit into their kind of rhythms in a way, which is a, a slightly odd thing to, to do yeah. sometimes. Yeah. Would you say that's quite a common practice within voice acting? It is right now, yeah. And and my preference is definitely to do motion, like to do the whole thing myself. Is mm. that is definitely my preference. So all the choices are um, are sort of my own, and therefore are there's a cohesion between you know what the body is doing and what the voice is doing. Yeah. Um, but yes, I think because of the way games are made, it's a very sort of global uh, enterprise. And there's also budgets that are uh, come into play. Sometimes it's cheaper to do 
you know, the motion capture in one place and the voices in another place and then bring them together. Um, so it, it is quite common. Um, and it, I think it's a special skill in some ways that a lot of voice actors who do loads of games have gotten quite, quite good at delivering a really believable performance to somebody who's already performed the, the physical yeah. side of the character and, and, and really finding a way to marry those two things. Because sometimes you, you might find as, a, as a, a voice artist in a game that your rhythms are, are totally different from the way the, the physical uh, actor played them when they did motion capture. So it yeah. um, requires a lot of flexibility and yeah. Yeah, because I guess it sounds like you, you have less creative freedom. Uh, so, yeah, I imagine it would be a, a lot more difficult. Yes, it can be. I mean, with Celine, you know, she's not, because she's only ever speaking to herself and scout logs and yeah. things like that. I, I had a lot of freedom with her because it, you know, the the scenes with the with the physical side of it were really just her in action dealing with the world around yeah. her whereas for example when i did karen bowman in wildlands um that was the character that the motion capture was done in la and then um i had the, the cut scenes with other characters and and i had to speak with other characters and really match what what, what she was doing yeah. um, certainly her rhythms like if she made a gesture with her hand i would have to find that gesture so that again we could hear it in the voice um oh. so yeah it's a it's an interesting it, it's interesting sometimes i think to know the way games are made and and all yeah. the things that are stitched together you know to create these these moments of reality yeah definitely it does sound it yeah it sounds very different to a lot of like other art forms yeah yeah um so a bit of a tangent here so you mentioned to me that you've you've recently been diagnosed with ADHD. Mm, yes. Um, how do you think having ADHD has affected your career? Well, I think this is a recent diagnosis, literally within the past sort of year and a half, because I, um, a year and a half ago, I undertook um, an MA in actor training. Right. So at the beginning of this academic degree i was a bit worried because i've always struggled with reading like it takes me a long time to read and i knew with um a, a degree like a master's there'd be obviously a lot of reading mm. and uh, i was getting a bit stressed about that and at the same time i i was uh reading the guardian newspaper here in the uk and there was um, a few people who'd written about their experiences of being diagnosed with adhd as an adult and I had one of those penny drop moments where I was like, oh my God, that person is describing yeah. me. That's how I am in the world, like totally overwhelmed half the time, stressed out and um, really distracted. But it just didn't, I just didn't really know about it. Anyway, I got um, assessed and sure enough, I have ADHD and dyslexia. And um, one of the things about ADHD that's kind of useful is that you're either quite distracted or you have this ability to really hyper focus on things. And I began to realize that actually being in the booth, acting in games where it's just me is, <clears throat> excuse me, in some ways a job that's extremely well suited to, to my form of ADHD, which is an inattentive style, but also a little bit of hyperactivity as well. Um, it's, you know, you're alone. You've got this sort of body of work that takes tremendous amount of concentration yeah. sometimes, you know, to and, and focus to really bring to life what's going on with the character. And um, this is something that an ADHD person can be incredibly good at because we are able to just focus on, on one thing and really to take a deep, deep dive into it. Um, and we can do that for long, long periods of time. Whereas if there's a lot of stimulation around, like for example, being a, a actor on a, a film set or a TV set, then that kind of stimulation can become a little bit overwhelming. But of course in the voice booth, you don't have that because it's just you yeah. and your director and the sound engineer and that's it. So it's a very simple environment in some ways. Mm. So I think I began to realize that actually all the voice work I, I do is, um, <clears throat> in some ways a sort of gift for me as an ADHD person yeah. because I've been able to really thrive 
in that environment with this uh, sort of condition that, you know, in other aspects of life can make things really quite difficult. It definitely, it definitely sounds like it's, it is played into your hand to some degree. Uh, yeah. Like the, like you said, the hyper focus. Uh, do you think now that you're aware of it, you might change your approach to how you tackle uh, jobs in the future? I think so. I mean, certainly for film and TV, uh, I, I, it's really made me aware of how I need to, to take care of myself on mm. sets, on, on a set or envir in environments where there's a lot of stimulation. Because right. um, I don't know how much you know about ADHD, but one of the, the factors uh, that plays into it is everything presents as the same level of importance. So it can be really hard right. to um, differentiate, you know, what do I need to be focusing on here? Or even if you're able to identify, I need to be focusing right now on what the director is saying to me or my yeah. fellow actor everything else looms large. And I think uh, a, a non-ADHD brain is able to kind of position things that are important mm -hmm. um, and, and prioritize the things that are important and, and they will be able to focus properly on, on what is important. But ADHDers struggle with that a little bit. And what can happen is you get overwhelmed and then you get exhausted. And I would really experience that after a day on, on set. And I just think, what's wrong with me? Why am I so tired? Or I have a big headache or whatever. And I just couldn't figure out what was going on. And now in hindsight, I think, oh, that's what's going on. I, my brain is tired because it's processing, you know, a million things all, all at once. So now when I'm on set, I work in little breaks for myself. I just take time away and I, I don't, um, you know, set is a very social place. But I just, uh, I just think, well, this is what I need to do. I don't feel bad about it. I'll just uh, disappear for a little bit, yeah. collect myself, come back refreshed. And then in terms of acting in, um, in games, um, yeah. as I say, I think I've found just the perfect job for me in some ways. But yeah, if I do, you know, motion capture and stuff like that, then I'll be going through the same process of just making sure that my, mm -hmm. my brain has a bit of time to rest. But um, it's it's really nice to talk to you about it, Ross. I haven't really started talking about this uh, too much, um, but I think it's um, you know I, I think it's nice to sort of go over some of the struggles that that we all have with various things in our lives. And, and for anybody else out there who has ADHD who might be listening, it's I think it's good to appreciate how you know, a neurodivergence can in fact be a great gift in your life. It might require more management and understanding, you know, about how your brain works, but um, it can also provide some some really wonderful aspects uh, to, to your career and, and, and to your personal life and just your yeah. life in general, which is why I, I would like to start, you know, talking about it because I think I've really benefited from mm. having this, this brain of mine, which, you know, up until quite recently, I was sort of like, um, I just found it a bit of a mystery, so... Yeah. Yeah. No, it, de it definitely sounds it. Um, I, found, I found it interesting you mentioned uh, having to, like, take, take like, a small break away from everything just mm. to kind of recharge your, your brain. Because I think I, 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 I have anxiety. Mm. Um, and I find that just, like, being around my friends, like, after a while, I kind of need just some time to myself to recharge. Yeah, I find that yeah. quite interesting. Yes, I think it's. Um, I think we need to give ourselves permission to to do these things sometime. And and anxiety presents uh, in a big way with ADHD. Mm. Um, it, it it kind of I think for most people who have it really runs in in parallel with you know with what the other things that are going on, and um, and I can feel that too in social situations. Um, I absolutely love my friends and I love people, but. Oh, yeah. um, it's just yeah you just need that time away to just mm. i don't know just yeah recharge really yeah um so it's important to do that what do you think has been your favorite role throughout your career wow um do you know i, I really have enjoyed playing diana burnwood in hitman yeah. she is just so much fun and um, you know, I've been playing her for, I guess, 10 years now, pretty much. Mm. Um, and I adore her. I think she's such an amazing woman. I love her intelligence. She's got this wonderful sense of humor, which is always 
so much fun to dive into, you know, in the sessions. We always have a lot of fun with how far we should take her wry sense of humor. Um, and I love her relationship with Agent 47. And I think she's the character who's, you know, over the kind of Hitman franchise, um, certainly the, the games that I've been involved in in, in Hitman. I, I feel like she's really evolved and, and grown and um, and she's just a pleasure to spend time with. So mm. I think that that she is my favorite. I love Celine too for, for very different reasons. Um, but, and I've sort of touched on this in other interviews, playing Celine is, you know, she goes through such a, a tremendous journey and it's yeah. it's not an easy one. So I, I, I have um, really uh, adored playing Celine, but Diana is a little bit more fun to play. Yeah, I guess as well, <laughs> if, if you've been playing her for 10 years, you've got more of an emotional attachment to her. Yes, that's right. Yes, I'm, I'm pretty connected to her. And uh, um, yeah, so it's, you know, I, I, you know, the Hitman franchise is, if it's not over, it's certainly on hold for a, a little while. So mm. I will, I will miss her. 